Hey guys, Dan up here, and today we are at a subscriber's home. This is Matthew, and he's going to show us around his garden and property and show us all the stuff he's doing with Back to Eden. So, what are these right here? So, these are a couple of fig trees, and I've uh, mulched them with wood chips just kind of to help protect them from the cold so they didn't get, don't get froze. It got really cold last year and froze this one to the ground. I just planted the taller one here this fall and I wanted to make sure it would make it through the winter. So I, I put the cover on it. Now when it gets springtime or something, you're gonna remove these right. fences and drop all the... Okay. As soon as, you know, as soon as it's 30 degrees is probably fine, but nine degrees, it's not too happy. And what kind of fig trees are these? So the this is Black Mission, and that's a brown turkey. We're gonna remove this plastic and mulch here better. I just recently mulched around here. Yeah, we, you know, we've got a lot of bindweed or morning glory, mm -hmm. and so it's, it's kind of a nuisance. And so we had been covering a bit like this to kind of suppress that and see if we could kill that off before we would mulch everywhere. And out back we didn't we didn't put the plastic mulch down and we just would go, you know, once a month or something and dig it up as much as we can, that sure. kind of thing. And we do have some Bermuda, which is a real problem too. It goes straight through the wood chips, no problem. It really? says thank you mm -hmm. and really grows good. <laughs> so we either dig it out and you go back like the next month or something and dig it out again because it shows you where it is. And I've done that and that works. It's just time consuming. So sometimes we'll dig around the edges of the landscape fabric where we're going to put it. And just to save time, and we'll put the landscape fabric in, in, the, in the middle. It doesn't have enough energy to get to the edges to get out. It's an apricot. No, it go in. Um, when I started pruning it, it had a center, you know, they call them water sprouts and it was going straight up and right. pretty tall and I cut that out and I've been trying to keep it shorter. So I did sort of do a, a prune on it. And one thing that I do with the branches is instead of, I don't have, I mean, I do have a chipper, but it's, it's time consuming sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I'll just cut the branches and leaves in about maybe a foot or six inch sections and just throw them on the ground and then mulch over the top with wood chips that I, you know, we get from our wrists. This is a mulberry tree and it was, it was here when we got here and I'm pretty sure it came from seed. There's a lady down the road that has a few big mulberry trees and I think the birds right. drop mulberry seeds here and there. And we used to have like a, a little shed over in that corner Oh, maybe eight years ago or something, we got like 80 mile an hour winds through here and the, the shed flew to pieces and it actually knocked this tree over. And I just never set it up. And so we've just been pruning it so we can just walk around and pick the fruit and eat it. And I mulched. We get this material is, comes out of horse stable. Mm -hmm. So it's got, you know, horse manure and, and wood shavings. I don't like it so much because it sort of sticks to my feet and, mm -hmm. you know, you track it all over the place. So I'm kind of covering it up. But we mulched in this area because I had that and with that. And between that and the leaves and the wood chips. And over in the corner there is horseradish. So I mulched, mulched the whole thing last winter. I didn't mulch it this year. I just put wood chips over the whole thing and they came back up through. And the leaves are actually pretty good. They taste like, you know, horseradishy stuff. So I can mix those in, you know, as in a salad dressing or to make a sauce. This is, we called it a melon tunnel. I saw this, this tunnel, I think they were doing it in Japan where they would grow melons inside of here. So the melons would climb up and they would hang down. And so it worked for us, except this isn't like the sturdiest mm -hmm. cattle panels ever. 
And so once it gets a lot of weight on it, it wants to sag over. So I need to kind of rethink it a little bit. But we grew cucumbers on it and it's it, and melons, even tomatoes. It's actually a pretty good idea because they kind of hang down here. You mm -hmm. don't have to, you know, try and climb up a fence after them. And you can see, you know, you can walk on both sides of them and they'll get up over here. And what was kind of fun when we grew melons is the melons really produce a lot of foliage. And so it was just like this green tunnel. Mm -hmm. And in the summertime, I'd come in here and take naps. And I noticed the air was just like pure and clean, like, like you know, being in the woods or something like that. It almost sort of purified the air just right in there. It, it definitely felt different than being out of it. Mm -hmm. So That's a cool idea. I like that. This is a beehive. Oh, I was wondering why you had the stump there. So, I worked as a commercial beekeeper for about 20 years. Really? But so you just let them live in there and you don't get, like, collect any of the honey or anything? No, I don't. Do they but swarm? I think they did swarm this year. So, people call us, call my parents, when they have swarms mm -hmm. because we've been beekeepers for a long time. And so some lady said, hey, we're going to have this tree cut down, there's some bees in it, I'd like to save them. So when the arborist was there, I went out and he cut the tree and um, put it onto the truck and I brought it home and I put it on the pallet there and they've, I've been able to move it around and it, it's better insulated than a regular beehive. So I have... I have a couple of regular beehives and it was cold and so I actually moved them into the warehouse mm -hmm. where it would be a little bit warmer but these guys are fine cold weather whatever they seem to be doing fine in here actually when he was going to originally cut it right here and mm -hmm. I said ah oh, that looks like it's fairly close to the center of you know or the brood might be in there the bees might be at that level and I'm like, ah, oh, cut it a little lower. And so he cut it lower, but the way I didn't take my forklift to put it on the truck, because he's like, ah, oh, I got a tractor, I'll lift it on for you. And he had some tongs that, that, you know, clamped on there, but he couldn't get it high enough to get it on the truck. Mm. So I'm like, okay, well, go ahead and cut it off there. And so he cut it off and it actually exposed the cluster of bees. It didn't actually cut into them, but they were right there. And so we put we put this extra piece on the truck. And then when I got it home, there was some dead wood and stuff in there and I cleaned it out and I actually, a, a couple of pieces of honeycomb fell out of it and I saved those. And, and um, you can actually take whole honeycomb and blend it in, you know, like as a base for an ice cream or something. The wax and everything gets all creamy with the fat and so, it you know it's a good way to go too and um, and I just put it back together and and you know I think our gardens do better with bees oh yeah so and it's, they're kind of fun to watch we have a bunch of different flowers around our garden so they have something to work all year and, and it's just kind of fun to see them you know oh something's blooming over here or you know that kind of deal so it's when you run 2,000 hives and you're working six days a week, bees aren't so fun. But if you actually have time to chill out and just observe, that's fun. This year has been mulched for quite a while, and you'll notice here this hasn't really gotten any water, right? And it doesn't break down. So, like Paul was saying, you know. People were saying, oh, don't put water on, on, on the wood chips. Well, if you want them to stay like this forever, don't put water on them. But if you want them to make good soil, the more you water it, the sooner you're going to have soil. You know, if you have water, use it and keep them moist all the time. You know, it doesn't take a lot of water. But, you know, you see here, that it's just, it right. just makes the best dirt ever. Yep. These are the strawberries that we covered with the wood right. chips. 
You can see a few of them sort yep. of poking out. These are the the June bearing, and these are the ever bearing here. These are the goji berries. And I've had these. There's a few different varieties of goji berries. I actually got these at a nursery in um, Salt Lake City. And I have some goji berries on the end of the house over there. They're definitely different. These leaves are more yellow. But in the spring, there's th these things produce so many goji berries, it's almost like there's not enough room for leaves. So, I don't, you know, I don't know what, what the difference is. Maybe somebody selected those for goji berries, but the other ones are actually better for leaves. So I use those for leaves. They're easy to pick. The leaves are bigger. These have smaller leaves and lots of berries. Those ones over there, you might get 20 berries off of each plant. Oh. And this, these plants, you get 200 berries yeah. off of each plant. I mean, when frost comes, there's green berries on there that didn't have time to ripen. So they're, they're pretty prolific. And I've been doing the wood chips and uh, leaf mulch here, I think. This will be the third year. The first year I planted these, we got a good uh, goji berry harvest. So if, you know, once you get going or you want to start, they'll grow in pots too if you want. Oh, really? So we could give you cuttings. I did start some of these from seed. Mm -hmm. So I took one of these fruits this, this spring and took the seeds out and they sprouted. Oh. So I have some of these from seed. You know, everything from seed is actually a new variety in a way, you know, because it crosses with right. who knows what. So these are some garlics and this is kind of a, an excess area that I've, I'm experimenting with. But these are the goji berries. These are probably eight or nine years old, but they've only been in the ground about five years. Mm -hmm and I pruned them back they were <laughs> they were about this tall and they were getting kind of crazy so I just chopped them back here this this year and some cactus this cactus came from a desert in Arizona we it sat in the back of behind the pickup seat for like two or three years and I went in there and was searching for something and it was wrapped in a newspaper and I got stabbed and I'm mm -hmm. like ah I'm like we should plant this thing <laughs> and it got in a, put in a pot, and the pot got broken, and it stayed out all winter, a couple of winters, and no love. And I said, hey, Donna, let's plant this thing over here. And it, it does fine in the, the summertime, but usually winter, it'll kind of lay down. And, you know, we actually done cleaned this out. You know, it'll, it'll have these dead petals and stuff. Right. She cleaned it out here earlier last year and it sort of came back and you know so it's it's kind of neat to just have these are my compost barrels like I'll throw my potting mix in here mm -hmm. so this is this is my recent sunflower stuff and right. you know actually leaves and I need to clean that up a little bit. But we just kind of throw our food scraps in here. It's not the, the best method ever and, and it ends up being, you know, so right. throw some leaves in it usually. They're all kind of frozen solid right now because it's been so cold. So I'll, I use these apple bins and I fill them up with uh, wood chips and I bring them over here with my forklift. And that makes it easy for me to handle. I think you can kind of see where it's a little wetter. Right. This is what I did yesterday where it's a little drier. You can see the mm -hmm. difference in color. From there to the apricot tree is 12 bins, so about 12 yards. Wow. And 12 yards would probably be more, more than most arborists are gonna bring in one dump on their truck. Mm -hmm. So I mean it it's easy to use this stuff up. I'm gonna run out, and I, I, I probably put on a hundred bins so far this year. 
you know? And it's not, you know, 12 bins probably only takes me four or five hours to put on, but I can only do so much in a day and I'm like, you know, my hands hurt and my mm -hmm. back hurts. So I kind of work half days at it. And then it takes me, oh, a couple hours to fill the bins up again. So. These are all your bins for yeah. wood chips so and whatnot. Empty ones. These are wood chips, those are the whole leaves. And we have some bins of compost. And um, I do a little bit of landscaping and I brought home some some ground up stump. Mm -hmm. So like they, they bring a stump grinder in and grind it up. And he had too much material there and he wanted to level it out. So I brought that home and I, we use it for mulch here and there. Um, this is some landscape fabric that we got from a, a nursery that was going out of business. Like two years ago, it was a, it was a, a rainy day, warm summer night and it had rained all day and then it stopped raining towards evening. Evening, And I went out to just see what was going on. And I, w and I walked out towards the garden, but there were so many worms that I couldn't walk out to the garden without stepping on worms. Mm -hmm. They were everywhere. They were all over our garden beds. They were all over the wood chips. And I've never seen so many worms. <laughs> You know, there wasn't that many worms in my front lawn where I haven't been doing anything mm -hmm. with it. But wherever the wood chips and the leaf mulch was, it was just crazy worms. 